A very good evening and welcome to the State of Scotch Football. It's Tuesday evening, uh, a very good victory for Celtic this fine Tuesday evening. But first and foremost, we need to get the, the priorities straight first and foremost and say we're sponsored, but wrong side, by Etive Watches. Uh, Amy, you might correct me here, but get, you get a 15% discount if you're a YouTube subscriber. So uh, here's hoping I've got that pretty straightforward. So if you're on YouTube, chance to win a lovely looking watch. And I'm not just lovely, and the, the watch itself isn't just lovely. Uh, we're joined by the lovely Amy Caravan. And Amy, good to good to be with yourself again to, to delve over a fine Celtic win. Absolutely, Dave. Thank you for having me. Um, I usually just do the, the wee bits and bobs behind the scenes for this show. So, no, I'm delighted to get on. Obviously, I'm just a bit of a glory hunter, just come around when Celtic are winning again. Um, but, no, I'm absolutely delighted to be back with you. And, yeah, there's plenty to dissect in the world of the Scottish football, Celtic, Aberdeen. There's um, There's been plenty going on the last 24 hours, hasn't there? Absolutely. Now, obviously, we have a lot of Celtic fans in, the, in this contingency when it comes to the show, and we're going to spend a good half, 35, 40 minutes delving over this game. And yeah, anyway, in, in terms of the first half today, it was quiet, stale, and it was a game requiring a goal. But apart from that, it was in the, it was a Celtic side that were getting into good channels and good areas, but just lacking that, that finish in the first half. Yeah, I think it was dominant. Um you know, it's kind of, it's always hard to kind of say that when you don't have the goal to really show for it. But um, I don't think Celtic were under really any pressure in the first half, except obviously for that glare and miss within the opening, that was in the opening five minutes, two, three minutes in. You know, that ball gets swept across, it's quite easy. Um, Tony Ralston get, gets beat quite easy and I'm, I'm a big Tony Ralston fan. There's not many times you hear me um, chucking any sort of blame at him. So, um, yeah, there, there was that chance and, you know, perhaps a more clinical side um, would, have, would have put that one away. I thought Joe Hart, you know, perhaps covered himself a bit well, you know, he got in front. But other than that, he didn't have an awful lot to do. A little bit shaky at times. Um, but... It, it was a game crying out for a goal. You're, you're spot on there. Um, and, and I did think it would, it would fall to Celtic. I thought in the first half, um, Yota was by far the, the bright spark. I thought Tom Rogic was getting into some good areas. He was hanging out quite on, on the right quite a lot. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much because, you know, Yota dominates the left so much. He's so comfortable out there. But Abad has been going really quiet for Celtic over the last few games. Um, he's been not struggling, but he, he's certainly, you know, he's going to face some, some fierce competition when James Forrest comes back. And I, I'm sure we'll get onto that a little bit later. But I thought Rogic was getting into some de decent positions. Um, David Turnbull as well. Pardon the pun. I thought on the turn, he was um, he was quite decent. Um, but but yeah, it, it was all coming from Yota. Anything prom uh, promising, positive. Uh, any any guy looking to to get a goal, it certainly looked like it was going to be the young Portuguese. Absolutely. Uh, just to clarify before we go to the next question, uh, a comment came in here from a Facebook user. I think we've used the last minute and a half very well to suggest that Amy Carvin is not a heart supporter. She's very much a Celtic supporter, so it's good to clarify things on that front. Do you think Celtic scored the first goal through through the half sheet the right time? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you're always wanting to, to try and get that goal early-ish in the, in the second half. I can't believe, you know, I think it was Chris Sutton at the time said, right, Celtic need to go on and try and try and kill the game now or see the game out, something like that. It was like, wow, Chris, there's still half an hour to go here. Have you not been, been watching Celtic recently? But well, let's dissect and talk about this goal because I could talk about this goal for, for 45 minutes. And to be honest, I don't actually even need to do it because our comments coming in. Stephen, spot on. If Liverpool scored that goal, the first goal that we did, sorry, it would be showing all over the place. It was sensational. And I was just, that's basically, you know, what I was going to touch upon. We, sh we should be allowed, to, this goal should be allowed, sorry. Um, it, it's world class. If it was Mo Salah and Sadio Mane, you'd be waxing lyrical over it. You know, the, the, the pass from a left back position because that's, that's where it's from you know you have to drive a, a few yards forward but he, he grabs that ball from the left back position gets himself a little bit more central and the speed the height the zip on that ball is is world class the first touch you know it, it speaks for itself not many players um you know pull that one off and the fact that it only requires one touch and then the strike like i say if it was any any other team uh, in the world if it's i think 
I think somebody uh, in the commentary was trying to trying to allude to if it's you know if that's done later on tonight in the Champions League, if that's Man City, Atletico, Liverpool, Club Bruges, if that's Jack Hendry, um, if it's anybody else, uh, that that goal is uh, getting branded world class, and you will see that it'll get clipped on Twitter. It'll be absolutely everywhere. Um, that was a, a stunning, stunning Celtic goal. I'm going to bring up the next comment here from Jake Ryan. Um, we'll go to staff. We'll go back up to Kuro Kyogo for the in a minute. But uh, he says staff felt solid for most of the game. But then makes a shocking error. Look like another by Arta. Good player, but always a mistake. And would you agree with, with what Jake's saying there? I am. Um, it's tough. I think probably up until that moment there was a few folk on twitter definitely as well and my, my dad actually said that in, in the living room he's like starfield's actually been pretty solid this game he's been not too bad and then he makes a, a kind of blunder like that and i'm assuming that, that jake's obviously referring to you know he's kind of mucking about the back it's almost like a back pass to joe hart but hart has to come out you know scramble and and try and pull, pull the ball away which he does so so it's little moments like that it's inconsistencies it's just to switch off you know Chris Sutton again, he's saying it in commentary, you just don't understand why. He had Liam Scales by that point, was, was beside him, so there's the options there. David Tumble likes to drop deep, certainly by that time in the game he's dropping deep as well, so there was bodies all around, um, and it's just that decision-making, so I don't want to brand him a, a kind of Bayata because Dedrick Bayata was a, was a fantastic servant to Celtic, and I think there was a period of time that Celtic was certainly missing him um, when he did move on, but it's just frustrating because, you know, the, the calibre of player that we're told Starfield really was. And I know it's, it's kind of one of these famous stories, that, you know, you, you never go by the, the, the YouTube show reel because everything just, everybody looking like fantastic on a, on a YouTube reel. So, you know, just, I think because he came obviously from the, the, the Russian Premier Division, so you think, you know, that's a physical standard, a really high standard of league. He's in the Swedish national team, not an easy national side to break into. And because for Sweden, he does sometimes play in a midfield role. So you think, you know, he'd be, he'd be quite comfortable with, with the ball at his feet and perhaps with a little bit of pressure be, because that that is obviously um, a little bit more of the nature of the game in that, in that position. So... It's, it's frustration on my part, especially with Starfield, because just as you think, you know, things are starting to tick over, he's getting a little bit more solid, a few decent um, run run the games, and then it's just little blunders like that. And against, again, against the more clinical side, Celtic are conceding there. So a, a good commenter actually on Axon, Charles Sweeney, is a great supporter of um, the, the State of Mind generally comes in and saying no negativity, please. So I'll try and be a little bit more positive, but Celtic, you have to be conscious of that because it's just a little bit sceptical at the back sometimes. I'm going to be a, a bit constructive here, Charles, just to clarify. But do you think Kyogo got um, when he got the goal? It was a, a monkey off the back a little bit because you look at it and, and, and think he could have played better in the first half. And then when he had the goal, um, his his mindset, the way he played, was just totally different. I don't know if it's you know perhaps monkey off the back. I think he was he was definitely trying the first half. It was just frustration. I think. Credit to, to um, Ferenc Varos, they really nullified Kyogo in the first half. You know, he was getting forced out, out wide and, and that's not where he's most effective. You know, Celtic need to need to get him through the middle, but I think in the first half they were a lot more solid. Um, and I think it's just credit to Celtic really in that second half, credit to Yota as well, obviously, for, for that ball. But um, in the first half, Kyogo was, was frustrated. You could, you could see it in his play, hence why he was drifting out wide. Um, and, you know, that's that's something that, that no Celtic fan really wants to see because you want them through the middle. But, you know, Turnbull couldn't get ball to feet. Um, Rogic couldn't get ball, ball to feet either. They were trying, you know, there was the looping balls over. Um, but even then, it was a bad really getting on the ends of it. So it was just more frustration. So from that perspective, yeah, perhaps it was in a monkey off the back. But I think it was nothing more than, than what his work they deserved. Because I think it's, it's tough as well, just because, you know, just because... Kyogo maybe doesn't get a goal in the first half doesn't mean that he didn't have a, have a good first half that he wasn't, you know, his work rate wasn't there, he wasn't trying, he was getting into those positions, it was just, you know, credit to, to the opposition that they were really getting there, getting touched tight to him but in that second half he was finding the freedom being able to, to drop off on the shoulder of the defenders as well and he found the, the joy that he deserved Absolutely, we're going to go to Jota, uh, first and foremost, before I go to the stats there's a lot of a lot of outcry just now regarding getting the same permanently, and I think I think if you're a Celtic hierarchy, I look at that and go, on, let's get the contract down to Jota uh, and, and get it signed. 
absolutely. I think it's six and a half million, perhaps it's getting branded around right now. Um, I would pay whatever. You know, this guy is an exceptional talent and you just don't want it to turn into another one of those, uh, right, we don't sign them, guy goes on loan next year to perhaps somebody down south or again in Europe and it only, you know, three, four years down the line we're talking about, oh, there's that guy, Yotta, who's playing at, you know, a, a top-level English side or a top-level side across across Europe. So you don't want to miss out on these opportunities and a, and a, a two, three years out of Yotta, you know, that could be a game-changer for Celtic. So he really looks like he's enjoying his football, um, which... Which is a, is a is a fantastic scene as well, you know. I think against Motherwell, I was just speaking about it yesterday on the um, on the bulletin. I thought he played quite freely. He was getting into the right positions at the right times. Um, you know, again, he took his goal really well at, at the weekend. But it, it's just you know his enthusiasm there. He's actually linking up quite well um, with Montgomery. And at the weekend, it was um, it was obviously ball and volley golly ball and ball and golly again um, and I just feel that he, he's really really enjoying his time at Celtic which is a great thing to see you know in those first few weeks um, under Ange Postacoglu when things were starting to, to take shape and you know it was it was ruthless Celtic the, the three up top when Abada was was firing um, Kyogo was firing and Yota was firing it was a joy to watch and that little unit that little, that little threesome up the top um, it was it was crucial and, and it just looks a great little little trio, great little partnerships going on, the little give and goes. You know, you look at the end, you look at the celebrations. I think that speaks volumes as well, the way that everybody goes, you know, to, to celebrate with Kyogo, to celebrate with Yota at the weekend as well. So it's just so, so crucial that, um, that Celtic sign on. He's that little maverick that Celtic have been looking for for a little while. And the stats for today were, you know, obviously played the whole 90 minutes, 74 touches, one assist, four key passes, 90% pack, passing accuracy, uh, 100% long balls accuracy, four shots on target, one shot blocked, 24 successful dribbles and four out of eight duels won. Uh, Silk's best player and that stats just goes to show how pivotal he was to the victory this afternoon. They start to speak for themselves. They start, those stats speak for themselves. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not always, you know, sometimes you just want to say, you know, that's just a great performance, don't want to have to dissect it all. But when something, um, you know, when when the numbers like that support it so so greatly, it's it's just fantastic. It was a, a really rounded performance. I think he deserved the goal. He had a great opportunity. Um, I think, you know, anyone down the, down the Lisbon Lions end, I think they certainly thought it was in. Um, it was a tough one. But... I think you could actually be quite surprised that he didn't score considering the, the goal scoring form that he is actually on. It wasn't too difficult a, a finish, I would have thought, um, from the player that he is. But the fact that he even got onto that side, you know, he, he, he peeked over basically to the right um, and, and found himself in that position. I was um, I, I was gutted for him actually that he never got the goal because that performance today warranted a goal for sure. Giacu Marcus, there's a lot of talk on the comments section coming in about Giacu Marcus and he, he, he came on and, and gave the Venice Varos defence a lot of issues when he, when he came on. Oh, I was extremely impressed by by um, by Yakimakis, absolutely. He just offered a totally different dimension. Um, again, and I understand why, because Abada, he wasn't having the, 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 the greatest of games. I thought he was really quiet, he was struggling. Hence, why all the, the the joy was really coming through Yota. So when he came on, he just he, again he he arguably should have got the goal. There was the the whipped corner in from Turnbull. It was a fantastic corner kick, um, and there was some speed on the ball, and he just couldn't quite get get his head on it. But it just offered a whole different um di dynamic to the game, and perhaps that's something I know a lot of fans are are wanting. You know, a little change in formation, four four two. I don't really know how that would suit Celtic. Um, the, the two up top, that, that's pretty sorted. But get, getting the rest in shape is perhaps a little bit tricky then now. But again, it's just another option to have. I thought Kyogo and, and Yakimakis, they did link up quite well just while they had a little period of time on together before um, before Kyogo departed. So, you know, he, he clipped that little ball in and again, Yakimakis just couldn't quite get on it. So it was, yeah, it was quite quite surprising to see just how involved he really was his physicality is, is um is night and day obviously to, to Kyogo's he's that technical gifted player but um to have that you know powerfully you you look at him he's he's absolutely massive so it, it's great that Celtic have another striker like that 
you know, Edward was always obviously quite quite a big guy, but he didn't always use his strength to the best of his ability. Nobody's really done that probably since since Musa Dembele. He always used his upper body strength quite well. So to have Yakimakis, just to see these early signs, get a few glimpses, um, I wouldn't have any qualms with him perhaps getting a start. You know, it's um it's it's great for squad rotation. Obviously, Ange touched upon that as in his pre-match, I think it was, yeah, that you know it, it's gonna it's, it's, a, it's a busy time of the calendar so rotation will be needed um, so to have another option coming off the bench and to be honest you just need to look at that, the fact that he's on the bench Mikey Johnson's on the bench, obviously Liam Scales came on as well but that bench was looking a lot more positive than it has done in, in recent months for Celtic so Branch to have these options, to have another striker as an option, to be able to protect pre- pre- to protect Kyle because you know he's so vital he's so important to the Celtic side so you know when a game's you're trying to see a game out or if a game is dead and buried not that this game was by by any stretch of the imagination but just to be able to take him off protect him a little bit because you know he was so missed during during that period of um, time on the sidelines for him it's just fantastic there is that other option now and it'll be just starting to to get the glimpses off Yakimakis and then hopefully the goals will start flooding in. On the subs front, you've raised the point perfectly. You'd leave Scales coming on and Mikey Johnston came, coming on in the latter. Did the latter had a lot of points when he came on, it, it, just the way he got about the park? Yeah, I was really pleasantly surprised by, by Mikey Johnson as well. Obviously, he's just fresh back from yet another injury. Um, 22 years old, I think he did in, in, uh, in commentary as well. So, you know, his, his career has been stop start, it's been plagued by injuries, and it's so frustrating because I think, you know, he was just getting to that stage before the, the big injury last season that he was starting to be a little bit of a starter. You know, he was getting games ahead of Moyle Elianusi at the time. Um, and he was just starting to finally get that that run of form that like many Celtic fans wanted him to get, that he des- he certainly deserved to get. And kind of what he had to prove, you know, um, he's been at the club obviously a long time. He, he broke through quite early. Um, so he has been on the the end of the, the the tongue for a lot of Celtic fans. So he came on um, and, and I thought he was really impressive. He, he liked to go quite central as well. He was very, very direct. Again, he fed in that fantastic ball to, to Yota. When, when he did obviously miss that opportunity that we were we were talking about earlier. But no, I was extremely impressed by him. And I just, again, it's just that, um, another positive option from the bench. There's no way right now that he's coming in um, in place of Yota because, you know, that, that man is, is totally undroppable right now. He's deserving of, of all the plaudits. Like you say, you, you can't drop a guy with, with those stats, but it just offers something else. Obviously, there's so much talk right there about how a bad is just not quite cutting it. And I don't know, Perhaps is it being highlighted more because Yota and Kyogo are really, um, really probably sort of surpassing expectations at this stage. Um, so Abad is kind of he's kind of the, the the black sheep right now, and he's sticking out a little bit. So it offers that other alternative that um, you know you could have Mikey Johnson on on the left, and then Yota shift over to the right because we've seen how effective he can be from the right. Played it earlier on in Europe as well. Sure, it was even better. Um, but he's played it a few times already, so it's just that other version, another option, more diversity. Um, so it's it's great to see. But yeah, I was I was really pleased to see Mikey Johnson on the pitch and uh, just having a little bit of an impact. He looked confident. You know, he wasn't shying away from the ball. He wanted to get on the ball, getting into those positions, driving forward, using his pace because you know that's one thing that that Mikey's got. He's um he's got terrific pace and he's got a, a wicked whip of the ball on him as well. Absolutely. I'm going to dissect the chick's question. Um, I pause if this, uh, and rather than being negative, and the Carl McGregor penalty, uh, it's it's not a goal, obviously, but and it, it could have been very nervy at that time. But thankfully for Celtic, they showed enough mentality to see this through and make sure it wasn't, well, what if uh, type of moment. Yeah, it's. Um... It's a weird one. You know, the, the penalty obviously was given and myself, my dad um, and my brother were all kind of going, I don't actually know who's going to take this, you know. Um, again, earlier on in Europe, it was Juranovic who took the penalty. It was a fantastic penalty. So we all thought, yeah, we've got a penalty taken on our hands now because obviously it was just always always odds on Edward. So, yeah, not not Cal's finest moment by any stretch of, stretch of the imagination. It wasn't a great penalty at all. Um, you know, he doesn't find the corner. It's perfect height for the goalkeeper. It is a decent save, but you know, it's not it's not an outstanding one by by any means. 
the left foot just cutting across. He, he's he's got a decent amount of power behind it, which does add to the, the the greatness, perhaps per se, of the save. But you know, he doesn't find the corner. He doesn't find sign net or anything like that. But again. I think you're more just wanting to talk about in the lead up to the goal, uh, sorry, in the lead up to to the penalty. You know, young Montgomery's getting into a, a great position there, and I thought he really struggled today. I think it was evident that he is still perhaps carrying a little bit of the knock or the, the injury that he picked up in training, and that was only on Friday, um, yeah. because Postacoglu obviously said just before the Motherwell game that it was obviously yesterday. So, I am. Um, I felt to get 70 minutes, I think Celtic got out of him. I think that was pretty impressive. But he just, he did look a little bit leggy, a little bit um, jaded. But to, to get into that position, that drive, you know, credit to him. So, and the lead up to that, it was great to see as well. But yeah, on the actual penalty itself, I think Celtic will maybe need to find uh, find themselves a new penalty taker. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks very much for the comments. Keep keep coming in, keep them coming in. Um, Scott Howes raised a question here asking if, if I'm on if I'm a Tim uh or a Celtic fan, I should say. Uh I, I'm I'm not actually. Uh I'm an Aberdeen fan or, uh, and I'm a journalist, so uh, no, I'm, no, I'm not a Celtic fan. Uh but I, I have given you the orders just for this specific reason that it's obviously yellow and a good bit of a Celtic all the same. And uh, you're getting a lot of compliments this afternoon and this evening, sorry as well, Amy. Uh but just based on the, the second goal, uh, Turnbull does really well. I know it's been taken away from him, according to UEFA, but has it? Uh, apparently, yeah. Uh, oh no! But good, good second that. goal, and it killed the game off as a contest when uh, Turnbull goes and scores that second goal. What a disaster! DT deserves it. Um, yeah, that's it's one of those you've just got to kind of laugh at. It, just that, thank goodness, it did end up in the net, obviously. It's great build-up play. It really is, you know, getting the ball into that position for Turnbull, obviously, to, to be there. I don't really know what quite happens. Um, you know, it's it kind of goes behind him. He clearly missed kicks a little bit of nothing, really. Um, and then I did think at the time that perhaps it took a few knocks off the um, off the defender and perhaps the goalkeeper as well. But, you know, the second goal was needed and it was nothing nothing less than Celtic deserved. Um I thought at that time I was thinking, God, I'm going to need to come on this show and just go, you know, it was quite an every one nil because it wasn't an every one nil. The amount of chances that Celtic created, um, and especially after that, it easily could have been after after the second was it was scored, it could have been four or five, and there was a few earlier on as well, you know, that we have kind of touched upon. But Yota definitely should have got his goal. Um, so the two makes it slightly more comfortable. Um, you know, Yara actually always wanting that third because Celtic are just still so sceptical at the back. You know, there's there's those chances, 80th minute onwards, you just think, how many times in Europe? Someday I'll come up because I don't know off the top of my head, but the amount of times that Celtic have conceded the goal in Europe, 80 minutes beyond, um, it'll be ridiculously high. Like, I, I've witnessed so many, it's, it's crazy. Um, and it's heartbreaking. So... No, the the second was was definitely needed, um, and yeah, nothing nothing more than that, that Celtic did deserve. Absolutely. Do you think there's a, a, a change in mentality to an extent from Celtic? Because you look at the last three days, it's been a very positive three days for Celtic. You, it's a fantastic victory over my on Saturday. With not exactly the, the most vintage vintage of performances. I'm going to use a Tony Haggerty uh, line here, and then tonight. The first half wasn't pretty, but then you got the job done. So, do you think it's a, there's a difference in, in the Celtic side now compared to where what it would have been like, let's say four or five weeks ago? Absolutely, there's there's definitely been a momentum shift. Um, you know, I think the, the camp seems happier for sure. Um, everything's going well. Everything's easier when you're winning, isn't it? Um, Dave, you won't know that as an Aberdeen fan, but um, no, <laughs> it, is, it is a lot easier when you're winning, believe me. Um, it just makes everybody feel good about themselves as well. I think today's performance definitely adds to it. You know, Motherwell, obviously the, the wind was there and there were really good elements to the game, but like you say, it wasn't one for for the for the history books. It was one of those, right, three points, let's just, let's just uh, move on, get on to the next one. But tonight was a really, really positive performance you have to take a lot of positives out of that. And I think the fact that Celtic easily could have scored four, five, six, that, that speaks volumes for them itself. Perhaps the only um, the only negative is that it wasn't that because you do kind of just want that or that recognition. 
goal difference as well. God knows if that, that will come into play. You hope not. Um, but it's um, it's. I think after what happened with, with Leverkusen, you know, it kind of a, it, it was an embarrassment. It was an appalling performance just before we came on, Dave. We were kind of referring to it. You know, there was obviously a lot of goals scored against Betis. But again, it was it was disappointing in the manner that then everything kind of, you know, turned quite so quickly. So it would have been nice to have, to have got some goals back and just kind of put ourselves back in a, into a better position. But there's no denying it, you know, Celtic walk away uh, in a lot, a hell of a lot better position than... Um, than what we are uh, than what we were earlier on today or yesterday, but it was yeah, it was a positive performance. It was a it's not complete, but uh, it was definitely needed. That it was one of the better Celtic performances in Europe, certainly in recent memory. Charles, I'm not being negative here for Mick's question, but I'm just being very brutally honest. A uh, good crowd today, Amy. Fifty thousand four hundred twenty-seven. Fantastic support. Absolutely. Um, I was meant to be at the game, but uh, you know, work commitments. You just wanted to come on. Otherwise, I exactly. Game, yeah. Dave, I did. You know, why be at a game when you can talk about a game? Absolutely. I, I wouldn't be able to do this right now if I was driving back along the M8, which is an absolute nightmare right now. But, um, you know, that just speaks it speaks volumes of the incredible Celtic support. That's a half three kickoff. I would like to know perhaps how many line managers, you know, were maybe going when the crowd, when it cut to the crowd. Oh, I recognise that guy. He should maybe be in work right now. But um, no, it was a fantastic turnout. So for 50,000, above 50,000, half three on a Tuesday afternoon, I don't know. It actually didn't look too bad a day through in Glasgow. It's been pretty dreek through here, to, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but no, it just shows the absolutely incredible Celtic support. I'm not surprised um, in any matter of means. But um, no, it, it certainly added to it. And again, I think perhaps, perhaps one of the commentators touched on it as well. I think that that you know that maybe that was a, a factor to to why Ferenc Farrell's were quite the side that, that Celtic faced last season. Obviously, that game was behind closed doors. But today, I think you know from from the off when there was obviously the taking off the knee, it was a hostile environment, um, and and the fans just created an atmosphere that. You know, to be honest, Hungarian football again, that that is that is a hostile environment. So it's not a totally different game changer. I speak to, to Kev McCluskey quite a bit and he speaks of the, the atmosphere atmos, atmos, atmospheres that he experiences over there. But it was definitely one of those twelve twelve man kind of games. Um and yeah, the, the, the fans certainly played their part part as always. Yeah. Just to clarify what I mentioned, the terrible goal has indeed been ruled out and it's uh let me get it straight. A ballot vexi on goal. So I, I've got no, my pronunci- I've got my pronunciation correct there, but just in terms of half three and a Tuesday, it's just, it's just sensational how this is all panned out because half three and Tuesday isn't ideal for everybody, and, and the crowds made a, a massive part. Or moving forward, if, if this situation was to erupt again, I think we've just found out that it could be a, a huge positive moving forward if we ever have to play a game uh, on a on a on an afternoon or a Thursday afternoon or any other afternoon for that matter. I certainly I agree with you, yeah, but I hope it's not something that becomes, you know, a, a fixture of, of European football in Scotland. You know, it's just it's not the same. You don't get the same buzz about it. You know, my, my dad's working from home still, so you know, he's he stops down every 10, 15 minutes when he's not supposed to for five minutes. So that sort of thing, it's not the easiest. Um and it's not it's not the way forward. You know, you want European football at night. That's why the disco lights were installed. You can't be doing that half to do on a Tuesday afternoon. I am um, but I think it just kind of takes the, the the buzz out of it a little bit. There's something special, you know, if you talk to players or, or fans. Again, Dave, you won't really know this as an Aberdeen fan, but walking to, to a game of European football, <laughs> at, um, you know, quarter to eight, eight o'clock at night, it's, it's something magical. Um, and it all goes dark in the, on the cold kind of October nights as well that we're, we're certainly experiencing right now. It's all adds to it. It's all part and partial. Um, you know, and everybody's got their own individual stories. Um you know, like mine's has always been having to pick my dad up at Hermiston Gate. He obviously works in Edinburgh, so he'll get the bus out to Hermiston Gate and then we'll drive through. So it's all little things like that that all adds to it. You're not going to be doing that at half three. You know, we were talking earlier what time would we actually have had to have left if we if we did go to the game, and it just it's just not the same. Obviously, it's exceptional circumstances right now but with COP COP twenty six sorry and everything that's taken over um there and and. Uh, the effects that's happened just kind of on wider society right now while everything the final few pieces uh, the jigsaw are getting put in place but 
yeah, it obviously it's a an example that it works. And there's gonna be there's is that a game in Russia tomorrow? Is it Spartak Moscow that plays tomorrow afternoon as well? Yeah. Right. yeah. There's um yeah, it's just it's not the same. I'm not even a big fan of the five o'clock kickoffs, you know. I find yeah. that really hard to be to be watching Celtic at five past five or whatever it is. They I always find them pretty tough. There's something nice about, you know, you have your you've had your dinner and settle in. Um and and then you're you're at the game or if you're having to watch it from home with a with a can perhaps um no you, again you're not doing that I can't be drinking at half three on a Tuesday afternoon absolutely a lot of momentum this afternoon Amy uh, the clean sheet the two goals a lot of positivity it, it just all bodes bodes well and the fact that you do have that clean sheet, we, we, we touched upon it both off screen and on, on screen about the fact that there's still a lot of exposure in the Celtic defence, even though they kept the clean sheet this afternoon. But you take the you take the victory first and foremost, but secondly, massive positive there being a clean sheet. Yeah, that is, you know, that for me is just that's like another goal, you know. Um and it's kind of as we were saying, yes, it was a dominant performance and and everything you know and it could have Celtic easily could have scored six but in exactly the same breath Celtic easily could have conceded two or three that is the negativity coming out of me but you've got to be realistic as well against a more clinical side Celtic are going to get punished for that and Celtic have been punished for that in, in, in the recent past and just for, for God knows how long so no to, to get that clean sheet um was was vital and I think Joe Hart will be really really pleased about that because there was a few times he was called upon um and not because of any great Ferenc Varos play more just from you know mishaps to Celtic defenders just just slacking a little bit there was even you know I thought Cameron Carter Vickers had a really really solid game really solid game but then right at the death he makes just there was just quite that silly little moment Tony Ralston's forced to bust an absolute gut and you know and make that vital interception a uh, excuse my ignorance, but I'm not quite sure who the who the uh, attacker was at the time. I don't know if it was me. I don't think it was, but I think everybody will kind of know the the situation I'm referring, I'm referring to. It was just too easy um, down that right hand flank, and, and like I say, Dot Ralston totally out of nowhere, really bust the gut, beat the man, and then did did get that interception. But no, I thought Joe Hart had a had a really sound game. Um, and there was a few times he just uses his experience really, really well because, you know, you look at, again, we were talking just before we came on air there, Dave, you look at Saturday's game, I think within the opening few minutes, Joe Hart's having to play play about with the ball at the back, you know, that little back heel right on, on the line. It looks great that it, it came off, you know, and everybody can clip it and say that's a moment of magic, but wow, that it's, you know, you take a sharp and take off breath, take off breath in those moments, but clean sheet, positive you can't really ask for much more than that you follow the hoys analytics on twitter do you i think so yeah yeah i should do yeah, hope so. yeah, they've, they've just produced a, a great point on twitter saying what a difference a year makes the shot map show just how much better silk have come, become against various virus uh, there's a lot more higher quality chances uh compared to less pointless long shots and you've seen that because it's not like players are shooting from 25, 30 yards. Uh, no, uh, it's, they're getting into really good areas and, and providing a threat almost imminently. Yeah, I think that was perhaps Celtic's downfall in the first half, actually. But instead of having that pop, you know, from 25, 30 yards um, that Celtic have been partial to over the last few seasons, that they're almost trying to walk it in. You know, they were perhaps going to be overcomplicating things. Um, but... Not that I certainly thought that, not that I definitely thought that they were overcomplicating things, but I just think they were just trying to, you know, get into that the right nitty gritty positions. Um, you know, trying to get Yota right on the ball, whip the ball in. And sometimes the players just weren't there. But again, I think that's just a credit to, to Ferenc Varos that, you know, they, they had the numbers in that first half. The second, they were obviously trying to be a little bit more expansive, go for a go for a goal for themselves. Because in the first half it was very much on the counter attack. You knew that's how it would be, you know, if a side um such as Ferenc, Ferenc Faro, sorry, who are in a similar position to Celtic right now, not picked up a point in Europe. You know, you, they know as well that Celtic are going to come flying out the trap straight away, as they've done. But they, they have to sit back and just take on the pressure. But they've done that really rather superbly. So you've, you've got to give credit to them. They frustrated Celtic. And then going in at half time, as much as Ange Postacoglu would have been happy about that, absolutely, because there was a lot of positive play, he'd have been frustrated because nothing had quite broke down. While in the other camp, 
you know, Ferenc Varos so thought, well, our goalkeeper wasn't forced into any real great saves, you know, there's a few comfortable ones, Cal McGregor had the pop as well, that, that was actually in the second half, but there was nothing really that you're going, that is a world-class save, because he wasn't forced into it, and that is basically because Kyogo Furuhashi was, was nullified, which we've obviously referred to. Um, so, so yeah, as a, as a credit to Ferenc Varos in that, in that first half, but there's just so much positivity to be taken from today. Obviously, we can't see the comments in the comment section about Twitter, but I've noticed someone on Twitter said Joe Hart seems relaxed at home in paradise. I think his confidence is returning and he has won over those that, who doubted him. And you could, you could just tell there's a bit of a bit of chill about Joe Hart compared to other clubs he's been at in recent times where he, he's been at clubs, but been a little bit under pressure, but he, he doesn't seem to have that pressure at Celtic. No, I think it's because, you know, he's, he's walked right in um, and, and as everybody kind of knew he was, um, was going to be. And I think from right from the off, he'll have been made very aware of what his position was. You know, he wasn't going to be a backup to a world-class French goalkeeper as he was down in, um, down in Tottenham. And then obviously, he wasn't terrible over in, in Syria, uh, but it just never quite clicked totally with, with Trino. But I think he's at a level right now that he knows what's expected of him obviously for um for the Scottish Premiership it'll probably be well it is there's no denying it is it's a lower level than it, than he has been playing at but for, for for a guy of Joe Hart's caliber European football is, is what is vital. So he's getting that and he's still getting to showcase his skills on, on one of the biggest stages. So I think that all adds to it. He knows his position. I personally believe uh, him, you know, when when Cal McGregor was injured recently, the fact that he was given the armband so quickly and quite comfortably by by Ange Postecoglou that speaks a lot. I think when when Hart came in, he, he knew right away and he said right away that his experience was going to be vital and his experiences. You know, this is a guy that's been to World Cups, he's been to you know the business end of of European football, Champions League football, he's won English Premier Leagues, he's played at the very top for a very very long period of time and played under some of the greatest managers. So he has learned a lot. We we talk about so much, you know, guys come with experience in the same breath. You know, on the same day, in the same Twitter post, actually, he was signed alongside James McCarthy. And we say, you know, the experience that McCarthy brings. But the experience that McCarthy brings and the experience that Hart brings are two totally different things. And Hart is clearly, you know, given off that sort of experience and he's using it. You look how vocal he is for Celtic. Um, you know, you, you can hear him day in, day out. He, he likes sitting high perhaps sometimes a little bit too high for me. I do think one day he's going to experience what David Marshall experienced in the Euros, but I, I certainly hope not. I hope I'm not jinxing it. Or sometimes I just like, Joe, take a wee step back. But, you know, I think he um, I think he, he likes that sort of commanding role that he's got within Celtic. Callum McGregor, I think, is, you know, totally and utterly encapsulated and being Celtic captain right now. But as much as he is vocal, He's not the loudest, you know. He's he's constantly talking, but he's not a shouter at all times. Um, but you've you've got that from Joe Hart, I think as well. Um, there perhaps has to be something with with Cameron Carter Vickers as well. They both came from from Spurs. I know Carter Vickers obviously spent time on, on away at Bournemouth on loan, but you're still, you know, for for a large part of um of the season, the preseason, they they were in quite close contact. So there's definitely a understanding there there is uh there's a trust there as well perhaps that isn't there with starfelt which you can understand because you know Hart is at least aware of who who um who carter vickers is but a little powerful little triangles building at the back there something that was not there for celtic over the um the last few seasons certainly not last season keep your comments in much appreciated next question i want to delve into the midfield now, obviously, we've seen Turnbull and McGregor playing with each other this afternoon. There was a lot of talk about Carl McGregor being a little bit overcooked when he picked up his injury, but he's back. And do, you think, do you think the Turnbull and McGregor partnership is the best partnership Celtic have right now in midfield? Um, I quite like the the total triangle actually of Rogic, Turnbull, and, and McGregor, and it's going to be one. You know, it's going to be one that dissected and, and talked about forever because. McGregor's obviously left being that deeper role um, and he's getting asked to, to command that kind of area. But Turnbull and Rogic, they're, they're obviously both used to be in the 10. They, they both like to be the 10. Who's quicker? It's kind of a toss-up, but it is, it is going to be David Turnbull. But they're not, they're not the quickest and 
they're sharp when they're in the nitty gritty, but they don't like to do a lot of the running, you know. Um, again, I don't want to say lazy, but there's just not the the work ethic, the running ethic there that um, that perhaps Cal McGregor has in place. So it's an interesting little dynamic what goes on. Um, if Rogic goes forward, Turnbull does need to drop, and vice versa. Sometimes you just need it to be a little bit quicker. Um, but no, I'm certainly excited by it for sure. When you look at Celtic and, and, and the victory this afternoon, and the fact that Betis and Leverkusen play each other on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, do you look at this and say this is a this is potentially the comeback from Celtic? Um, comeback could be. It's definitely getting things back on the right track. You know, a, a win was absolutely vital. It was crucial. Um, and you know, if this when didn't transpire, you were kind of say you have to bid goodbye to, to Europa League. Right now, it's still obviously possible. You're, you're still you're still hoping for it. Perhaps Conference League will be a little bit more of a realistic option, but you have to still aim high. Win certainly creates that little bit of a margin between ourselves, obviously, and Ferenc Varos. But just getting that, that first one on the board is crucial. It could certainly start a sea change, and you've, you've got to hope that it can. Absolutely. When when you look at the past three days and, and, and overall, there was a massive rebuild at the start of the season, but we're pa- the Celtic are past that rebuild stage now. And you probably get to see the full uh, full brunt of the fruition and, and the way they want to play their football, but also the system seems to be working now. Uh, international break probably came at just the right time for Ange Postacoglu, just in the sense of the system that you want to go work on. And he, it's, it's helped in terms of the, the two the two victories, but most importantly, the two fantastic performances that have been put in. Yeah, and you know, it's these things are obviously going to develop and, and get better over time. That's just a given. Um, players are coming back, there's more players at his disposal. We're talking about Mikey Johnston, Yakimakis. You know, now there is Rogic and Turnbull both looking looking fairly fit as well. You're getting a decent amount of minutes out of both. There was David Turnbull again playing 90 minutes and getting a good. 65, 70 minutes, uh, I believe, out of out of Tom Rogic, which is always a good sign. Like I say, I'm a big fan of them both trying to be played together. I've, I've kind of always vouched for that, certainly on Axom. I'm kind of pushing for it. Um, and as much as I love them both going forward, because I just think they're so creative, hence what we're really referring to in that first half. Um, but I think sometimes, just on the defensive, I think sometimes one of them does just need to need to drop back that little bit better um, and perhaps just that little bit quicker. But everything is starting to gel a little bit more now. You know, you don't want to get too carried away, but you can't be too pessimistic. And if, you know, we're all quite critical of Celtic when things don't go right and we can get frustrated because we can see what Andrew's obviously trying to implement and now it is just coming to fruition that little bit more again. And it's happening on a greater stage, you know, where... Um, We've seen it now in Europe because it was there for the opening 25, 30 minutes against Betis. And, you know, Celtic looked absolutely exceptional. But if you look on the, the game against Leverkusen, although Celtic were actually OK, you know, it was just everything is just totally and utterly blinded then by, by losing those four terrible sloppy goals. But going forward, everything was there just bar the goal. But I think things are coming together now. Everything's gelling. The, the link-up play is there bodies are coming back which is just you know you can't you can't put a price on that so more time you know it was another um another a uh, international break sorry that obviously Celtic have came back from unscathed which is fantastic as well players are getting minutes they're getting used to each other the team's gelling that looked like a, a more complete performance tonight from a complete team it wasn't just bodies it was a real team ethic I'm going to go on your Amy Carvin love bus here for a minute and look at Tony Alston, but I'm also going to delve into Andy Montgomery as well. A lot of chat, I was just reading a Daily Record article just now, and they said that Andy Montgomery had a, an uncomfortable afternoon. I would kind of disagree with what the record was saying because, yeah, he was found out maybe on a couple of occasions, but on Montgomery, first and foremost, he had a, he had a solid game over in, over, over in the 90 minutes. Yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, he came off. I think 70 minutes perhaps yeah, for Liam Scales. Yeah, no, you're you're spot on, Dave. But I don't know. I just felt there was a few times that he, he was caught a little bit and he just didn't have it in him and, and through no fault of his own because he clearly is carrying a knock. I more worry about what does this really mean for Liam Scales? You know, the guy's obviously fit enough to be on the bench because, 
you wouldn't be there otherwise. So if to me, if you're fit enough to be on the bench, then you're fit enough to be playing. Obviously, you got a good 20 minutes out, only a good 20, 25 minutes. So th- there has to be some kind of trust in them. But I just, that's probably one of my one criticisms, perhaps, over the last two games. I didn't quite understand volleyball and goalies inclusion on Saturday because of, of today's game, you know, if Celtic perhaps weren't playing today, then I'd have totally understood um, why, because then, you know, it's just, you're you're just playing perhaps the, the next best option in ball and golly, but the fact that you knew he, w- he wouldn't be able to play today, because obviously he's admitted from the Europa League squad, um, I just didn't quite find, I found that one a little bit odd, considering that you, you never know if Adam Montgomery was going to be, be fit tonight or not, and it certainly didn't look it, so Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but I think even beforehand, I probably would have liked to have seen scales at the weekend and scales tonight as well, just because I got a little bit worried quite early on in the first half. You know, probably by half time, I would have said to, to have Montgomery off because I did think he was struggling. I just think it was clear that he was carrying something. So it was a tough, I think it was a tough night for him, but he'd done really well to win that penalty. You know, he was still getting in all the right areas. He wasn't troubled too much. Um, there, was, there was the odd time he was caught out. But again, I think perhaps um, that um, Cam Gregor could have just could have perhaps positioned a little bit better. But these things will come. He's still 19 years of age, and you know I've been really impressed by him since he's, he's came a part of the fold. Uh, well, first uh, the Celtic sort of talk by Tony and Ulster. I thought he was brilliant this afternoon. Yeah, I agree, Dave. Um, I thought he I thought he had another really good performance. I thought he was quite unlucky to, to perhaps receive that booking um, with. With the uh, when Yakamakis got yeah. injured, um, not injured, got fouled, um, mm. but then there was that crucial, crucial, um, you know, clearance inter- interception late on. So another decent performance from Ralston. I don't know for for how much longer he will be the the, the top choice at Celtic, but you know that guy gives a hundred and ten percent every single game, delivering some decent balls as well. A few not so decent, but I thought I thought he was um, a, a decent a decent a decent performance tonight from him. Absolutely. So refresh was refresh with the Celtic talk. Keep your comments coming in. Much appreciated. By the way, I do not always sleep over Aberdeen Football Club, just to stress. We are time of out a win, but I do not always stress. I do not always sleep. So we're absolutely fine with that. Uh I'm I'm busy getting on my job. I'm busy getting on with the fact that I get to go to a press box every week. So no comps from, from my behalf. But one man that liked to go on the rant last night for sure was a certain Mr. Dave Cormack and uh Amy, when I reflect and, and look at everything that happened with, with Dave Cormack last night and what he said in the radio to Kenny McIntyre and his team, I looked at it and thought, oh, okay, uh, you've, 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 you've first and foremost went in an outburst, but also you, you looked at it and, and defended your manager, but also took an attack in the media. Yeah, it was interesting for anyone that's not um, watched that I severely severely suggest um that, that you go and try and catch it. i think bbc sports and podcast will still yeah, be there I, won't it yeah I, I would um yeah I, I would go for it definitely um it was a bombshell perhaps i think it was announced quite late on that um that that he'd be appearing in aberdeen and um, tweeted it out you know that the the um that the invitation was accepted again. I think that in itself was perhaps an odd way to to say it. But wow, I don't know what your thoughts were on it, Dave. If that was my chairman, I would be a, kind of a little bit surprised considering I understand him coming out and supporting Glass. I do because you know he's not going to come out on radio and you know slander his his own manager. I do. I did kind of actually agree with him. Um, and when he was bringing it into relation with Hearts and Hibs, fair enough, you know, um, everything he said there was spot on this time last year. People were calling for, for Jack Ross's head at, at Hibs um, and Robbie Nielsen, you know, after the Broader Rangers defeat in the, in the Scottish Cup and then the league defeat to Allo as well. I certainly agreed with him there that you now look at how, how flying Hearts and Hibs are. But I think, and Dave, you'll know this better than me, but I don't think there were many at the time, certainly amongst Aberdeen support, that were totally and utterly, you know, in, in total agreement and support of, of Stephen Glass's appointment. I think it was um, perhaps given given a job to, to an old friend. Yeah. No, I mean, for, <laughs> I hate being self-conscious here, but uh, I'm, I'm a very laid-back guy. 
that I can tell you one guy that hasn't been laid back in the WhatsApp over the weekend. That's a certain contributor on the show called Dr. Grant Campbell. I've had glass this, glass this, glass this over the weekends. I, I've, I've, got, I've got glass in my head right now, if I'm going to be brutally honest with you. I think he deserves time. Um, Strange one of the doctors came in and said exactly the same thing. I do, I do think he deserves time. I do think Dave Cormack K, uh, was a little bit ranty, if I'm if that's even a, a word. Uh, I'll be honest with you saying that. I, I do think he, he deserves time and he, he deserves time to, to turn the predicament around because there's no getting away from it. It is a predicament. And, I mean, you'll argue this, uh, people argue with this by saying Tom Coates has done well, Doug United, Billy Dodds, is it at Cali doing a really good job for himself? But you also look at, at, at this and I mean, I've been a, a sleeping giant when you look at the whole scheme of things just in terms of results. They are a massive sleeping giant. And if, and if this sleeping giant st stays in its bed, they'll be in relegation trouble soon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they are a sleeping giant. There's no denying that. You know, you can't be having a, a club like Aberdeen and no one in 10, is it? Yeah, uh, or, and certainly um, five, five straight five defeats, defeats, five five straight defeats yeah, no one in 10. You know, that's not a record that you can be having at a club up there. I thought they had a decent transfer window, um, brought in some decent bodies, obviously, Abdusser and Scott Brown as well. Um, you look at the positive aspects of, of Calvin Ramsey. Um, I, I like what's happened up there. You're bringing through academy players on, on both flanks. So there is a lot of good happening, but I, I, something something isn't clicking. And I, I, I do... I do agree, hence why I, I say that I agree with, with Dave Cormack when he was reflecting upon the Hearts and Hibs scenario and hence why that he has given, given sorry, Dave Cormack a little bit, um, sorry, why he is, Dave Cormack has given Stephen Glass a little bit of time because it is so fresh in the door. But I think the frustration, what I would believe from, from Aberdeen fans is, is that obviously he got a little bit of time last season, didn't he? He, he got to come in, yeah. you know, get those few games. It was kind of positive. What there was was a two three one last season out of five something like uh, that. He, he, he had the quarantine and uh, took his first game in the start of April. Yeah, and then this, the start of the season, you know, it looked pretty promising. There was some decent um, Europa League qualifying ones as well. So everything was not on exactly on a high, but things were things were going well. And then it's just you know plummeted so quickly. Everything's went on a, on a drastic turnaround after that Rafe Rovers defeat in the in the cup. So. I think that's where the frustration comes from, that, that Stephen Glass got that little period last season at the tail end to get things in order, see really where, where his squad, his, his team were at. He got a little bit of um, support, obviously, during during the summer transfer window, got to bring bodies in. And now, when you would hope things would start to be coming to fruition, getting in a little bit of stride, um, Aber Aberdeen are, are, a, are in a struggling position. And again, you look at, you know, our next three games are against Hearts, Hibs and um, against Rangers. Right. Uh, it's not an easy run. It's not a nice run. Now, I don't mean to be very negative here, uh, Celtic fans, if you're listening at all. I've watched Aberdeen a few times now. Uh, I look at Scott Brown. I, I'm not going to delve into Dave Clamart now. I'm going to delve into Aberdeen's a football club and Aberdeen's a whole. I look at Scott Brown and as much as he offers stability, as much as he offers experience, as much as he offers leadership, I also look at the other side of this, and I'm going to be brutally honest with you here when I say this, I also look at the other side of this and say he doesn't offer enough, uh, what's the right word, resurgence or enough intensity when he's on the ball. I, I, I honestly feel when he's on the ball, it's not zing, let's get the ball forward. It's side, side, side. It's not what to bring the ball forward. Uh, and I don't know if you agree with me on that, Amy, but I just look at that and go and say, look, I, he likes to put the ball out wide instead of getting the ball forward. So who would you say is that that crucial figure then in the Aberdeen side to, to be getting the ball forward? Is it Lewis Ferguson? You know, who who is or, oh, or is, is that is is that the problem there, Dave, then that nobody is really, you know, playing that crucial pass. We're talking perhaps about Yota's pass today, or we're talking about the zip that, that Callum McGregor has on the ball, you know, they're the guys that are getting in the channels. I do agree that there's actually there's a as a, there's a gap in the market in, in the Celtic side as well, that there's nobody really breaking through the channels, breaking through the lines. Perhaps that's the um the same issue at Aberdeen. Yeah, and it's actually, I'm, I'm actually surprised you're agreeing with me here because, uh, sorry, not you, I, I mean the the viewers on our channel because uh, Charles and Scott are coming up saying uh, that they actually agree with me. Um, 
but yeah, I, 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 I honestly look at it and think we struggle to get that pass at the, the likes of Lewis Ferguson. There's been a lot of talk about how Lewis Ferguson start this season from an Aberdeen point of view, and I can maybe understand why these comments are coming up because you look at front Lewis Ferguson under McInnes, he was a very forward thinking player, whilst under Glass, he's more a laid back player, and that could be one possible purpose into why. Right. So, where do you see you know Aberdeen go, going from here? Obviously, it does look that that Stephen Glass' position is perhaps safer now. His comments at the weekend perhaps could have you know suggested a little bit differently. He himself came out and says, you know, I know we can't be having you know defeats like this and results like this, performances like this, and not have my not my job on the line, but you know perhaps come under a little bit of pressure. It's a tough run of fixtures for Aberdeen now. So, so where do you see? Um, any sort of positives coming from? I think Glass needs a, a big win first and foremost. Where he's going to get it from, time will tell. I mean, Saturday's a great opportunity to get that win, but I mean, Aberdeen are very good in terms of giving sides their first wins of the season. They gave St Mirren the, uh, the first win of the season fairly recently. Dundee got the first win of the weekend, courtesy of Aberdeen's um, misdemeanors. So it, it just goes to show where Aberdeen are at just now. And, um, I mean, when Stephen Glass eventually gets relieved of his duties, because it's going to be a, a a when not if situation now, unfortunately, and, I, I, and I'm not just speaking on behalf of myself here. I'm speaking on behalf of probably a majority of Aberdeen fans. And one thing I'd like to get out there is that uh, I don't know if you've seen listened to it yourself, Amy, but the, that uh, supporter in Radio Scotland after Corbett was on last night, and he was like, "I'm 49 years old. I've got two dodgy days, and I'm I could run faster than I am again." I mean, Neil McGinn is his agent. But Neil McGinn, from, from his Celtic days, was a very pacey player indeed. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I remember him. Um, I was that was me getting into my my love is not getting into my love of Celtic, but how I can remember Celtic from from my early days was yeah, Neil McGinn. Um, yeah, they they were they were decent days, and he's always been troublesome actually when when Celtic come come up against them um, you know and again I think there was a comment earlier on as well you know Johnny Hayes and, and both Scott Brown were on stats by stats sorry the best performers against them and that's kind of always been the case that it's always the guys that, that are um, the, the former players I think you know I think many Celtic fans myself included I was certainly got to lose Johnny Hayes to, to Aberdeen at that time I thought there's so many times last season that you were crying out for Johnny Hayes you know that little bit of inclusion as a substitution just that little bit of power a little bit of pace um, and that that's just another guy that gives 110% for the jersey yeah and I, I'd just like to clarify strange love the doctor I was on a massive hangover when that game was taking place between Aberdeen and Celtic so I I never got to see the true complexity of Scott Brown in that day in question uh I'm waiting on performances against like a quarter bug where I was at the game as a punter and I thought, what have I signed here? Um, Motherwell, I was covering the game when they lost to Motherwell 2-0. Uh, I thought he was poor that day. One thing I'd like to back up in that Motherwell game is the Cormac said in his interview last night, he made it, Alan Burroughs phoned him and says that Aberdeen were, were, were that's probably the best Aberdeen side he's seen in a long time. Well, I've... <laughs> I don't mean to be disrespectful to Alan Burroughs here, but he must have watched a completely different game from me. I was at that game and, yeah, I believe in a lot of possession, but did very little in front of goal, did very little cutting edge in front of goal as well. Yeah, um, I think that a little bit strange as well. It's certainly not the strongest Aberdeen side that I've, I've seen in recent years. But talking about Aberdeen in recent years, they've always been fairly successful against Hibs. You know, Hibs have struggled travelling up to Pataudry. Um I don't know the last time actually that they that they got a win. It's never been a, an easy venue, you know. It's not been that an easy venue for, for many clubs. Um, but Hibs have always struggled heading heading up to Petardry. So, can can you have a little bit of confidence and belief? Can you take something from that? Obviously, as well, Hibs had an extremely disappointing result of their own at the weekend there. Or does then that add fuel to their fire? You know that they need to bounce back from a really rather shocking result against Dundee United. I touched upon it in the show last night that if you if you stop Boyle and you stop Nisbet, you've got half a chance of winning a game of football. That's exactly what Dungeon did at the weekend. I mean, as much as they produced a fantastic performance and Mulgrew and um, Edwards are, are very good marshals at the back for Dungeon United and they're a very good side going forward. You also look at the, the Hibs attacking side and go, well, where's their instincts? Where's their troubles? And where's their, their exploits going to come from? And the majority of it does come from Boyle and Nisbet. I mean, they, they do have other uh, attacking 
attacking players in there. Uh, but you also look at it from another uh, another side and say that they've got a lot of players in there that that aren't up, up not aren't up to the job, but just don't fit the system and. I'll be honest with saying, if Boyle and, and Nisbet's out that team, uh, despite the fact that Nisbet's not starting the season very well from a Hibs point of view, you look at it and go, okay, where the Hibs get the, the goals from and where, where's Hibs dangers coming from? And the, 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 to an extent, been found out in the last few games, I, I, I feel. Yeah, I, I can completely agree with you. Obviously, you were at the, at the game, so I will certainly take your word over mine. Um, but no, there's... There's um there's something in nullifying Martin Boyle in particular. You know he's he's had a tremendous start to the season, international um internationally sorry as, as well as domestically. I, th- I think he's he's been a real asset this season. Yeah, well for the last few seasons. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean Martin Boyle's been a big player for both club and country. And he, he continues to show. It. I mean, what I just said there could be a m- bit more justifiable and understandable considering he was away. To the other side of the world, prior to playing Easter Road last Saturday, because he was obviously part of the Australia team. But I, I mean, I mean, when you when you mark Boyle and you might mark this bit out the game, uh, it, it's your game, the game's halfway done if, if, you, if you want an opposition point of view. That fact was proven to be the case on Saturday. But uh, we're past our mark, Amy. So uh, we've we've finished all we have to speak about. We spoke a very good 45 minutes of Celtic. A lot more than the Celtic state of mind ever do. So uh, um, we spoke in very good detail there. In the last 15 minutes, you'll be glad to see the end of my Aberdeen rant. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you.